Awesome. Thank you so much, Michael. This is a really great uh, pleasure and privilege to be here. I didn't realize it was your first day of class. <laughs> this is really exciting to get to be the first one to chat with you all. So uh, what I'll be talking about today is the work I'm doing in the HCI Institute at Carnegie Mellon on designing culturally relevant educational technology at a global scale. But before I dive into that topic, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about the broader context of the types of things we do in, in learning sciences in HCI. So uh, some example projects I'm going to show you. So here's one on personalization. This is um, what most people think about when they think about uh, AI or, or technology in education, and it's the ability to deliver the right content to the right learner at the right time, at the right pace, by knowing all about the learner and what we should deliver them. So we have a lot of projects that work on personalization. We also have a bunch of projects that then move on to adding a face onto that uh, personalized learning environment. So we build a lot of virtual agents. Here what you see is a, a teachable agent. So it's actually a, um, a virtual learner that the child gets to teach uh, these mathematical concepts. Um, so this is one of the, the applications that we have. And we show that building rapport between the learner and the virtual agent actually significantly impacts the learning outcomes that students receive. Sometimes we move on from a virtual face and actually put uh, an embodied face on the uh, educational technology. So here's a project that we're just starting with the Cosmo robot, uh, where it actually um, engages learners with facial expressions, with its voice, and really builds a rapport and a strength of relationship with the learner in order to facilitate them learning very difficult concepts in programming. So in this one, we're working with the Girl Scouts of America. So I'm, I'm super excited about that. Uh, and then the whole way up to doing something like putting sensors in the classroom and understanding um, uh, the positioning, the behavior of learners, and also actually of the instructor, as some of you might recognize this instructor. <laughs> <laughs> Chris Harrison, who's also in the HCI uh, Institute. Um, we can present instructors, for instance, with where their gaze is looking throughout the majority of class. So one learning science principle is that I should be walking around, looking at all of you, engaging you in my talk. <laughs> and this causes um, a, not only a better engagement from the student's point of view, but also greater learning as well. So these are all things we can do uh, to provide feedback to the instructor instructor on how they're doing in their classroom. So this is just a super broad overview of all of the different types of things that are happening in my lab. But today I wanted to talk to you about the fact that we're in the midst of an education breakthrough around the world. And so you can see here from this chart an image of the reduction in out of school children across the world. This is between 2000 and, and 2013, and now we're down even lower. Millions and millions and millions of new children are being introduced to schooling. And this is happening all around the world. You can see some of the greatest reductions are in uh, across Africa and in South and Southeast Asia. So this is really exciting. We finally have the opportunity to reach a generation of learners around the world who were never previously exposed to literacy, to mathematics, and to enable them a better future uh, through education. Yes. <laughs> yes. So there's a lot of infrastructural uh, infrastructural changes. There's a recognition that um, money money and investment needs to be placed into education. Um, there are, is a lot of philanthropic efforts going on right now, but also some of it's coming from places like the World Bank. So more and more schools are being built. Uh, more infrastructure is being developed that allows those to be built. Roads, uh, road networks, um, cell networks. All of those things are contributing to being able to actually get, get people into, physically into schools. So getting them physically into school is one thing. But we, at the same time, have a learning crisis on our hands. So if you look at this chart of high-income countries, we have 198 mil uh, million school-age children in those countries. Uh, 
70% of them will come out of school learning minimum secondary level skills. A full 8% of them will come out without even having learned basic, basic primary level skills of literacy and numeracy. Now, that's in high-income countries. If we look at middle-income countries, the picture looks a bit worse. We have um, 1,142 million school-aged children there, and almost 27% uh, of them will come out without learning any basic level skills. And if we look further at low-income countries, we see almost a mirror image of what's happening in high-income countries where almost 70% of our learners come out without having learned basic primary level skills. And this is despite the fact that over half of these children will have had more than four years of schooling. So they're in the school buildings, but the learning isn't happening. So this is our learning crisis that we're working on solving. Often through the use of technology. So this is a, a, one of the major solutions that's being proposed now um, is to distribute technology to schools and the learning will happen. One-to-one -one computing devices uh, that are intended to engage learners, um, to provide them with the support they need, uh, and to see those learning outcomes happen. Now, of course, we've got, had these solutions in mind. It's been almost 15 years now since some of the earliest projects started uh, distributing laptops in schools with the hope of changing uh, learners' abilities. We've spent almost a billion dollars of low-income countries' money in order to make this happen. And there's been almost no result uh, on learning gains from these technologies. And yet, why am I doing this? <laughs> we know that there are really positive outcomes from the use of technologies. So here are just some, uh, a set from Carnegie Mellon. Uh, students in, in second through fourth grade gain three times as much in, in reading fluency when they use an adaptive system called Project Listen compared to typical reading practice. Our socially adaptive robots produce 30% more math learning for middle school students than non-adaptive robots. Peer tutors give significantly better help when they are supported by artificial intelligence, and on and on and on. So, uh, so we know that there are positive impacts from technology, and this is even happening in Africa as well. So there's a great uh, meta-analysis um, called Identifying Effective Education Interventions in Sub-Saharan Africa, and it found that of all of the types of interventions that have been rigorously evaluated in Sub-Saharan Africa, including providing kids with school fees, reducing the class size, um, giving them school supplies like paper and pencil, the ones that have shown the most impact are the distribution of adaptive technology-assisted uh, learning and pedagogical changes. OK, so now we know that adaptive systems, right, ones that actually uh, provide the right support to the learner, those are the, the, the solutions that we can count on for Africa. So we're done. <laughs> all right, yay. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, all right, not quite. <laughs> Unfortunately, there's also a major uh, imbalance in the distribution of education research and ed tech research around the world. So we looked at uh, meta-analyses across a number of journals and conferences that are related to education or ed tech, Journal of Educational Psychology, Learning Sciences, Artificial Intelligence in Education, Learning at Scale. Nine, 75 to 93% across those different venues uh, um, the children, the learners in their studies are weird. <laughs> what do we mean by weird? Has anybody heard this term before? Yeah, okay, good, great. So they are Western educated, industrialized, rich and developed nations that are participating in this work. 
right? This, de despite the fact that we know that low-income countries are the ones that need uh, the vast majority of our support. Um, we also know, so this term comes from uh, Henrik et al. Uh, looking at psychology results across a wide number of psychology topics. And they have found that psychology insights that we thought applied to everybody in the world actually often do not hold true in these non-weird cultures. Well, why is that? Maybe because we are only studying a very specific small set of the population of the world and then publishing these results as if they apply to everyone. All right. And so many studies have shown is that what this leads to only only uh, working on this small population of the world and then trying to um, introduce these technologies or pedagogies into the rest of the world leads to boredom, lack of motivation, difficulty in comprehending the material, and in fact, often even times, um, staff leaving schools because they feel so frustrated uh, that the types of things they're being asked to do don't apply to their own classrooms. So we know this is a major, major problem. We know that education is a major problem, and we know that we haven't found the way to solve it yet. I, however, have been very fortunate enough to participate in research uh, across a wide set of sites, field sites, across a wide slope, uh, swath of the globe. And in so doing, in sitting in classrooms, in working with learners there, in introducing a set of technologies, we've been able to learn uh, quite a lot with the belief that AI and education can actually work for everybody around the world if we design it to. All right, so I'm going to tell you um, a little bit uh, about some principles that we've learned as we've worked across a variety of sites. And I'm going to, in particular, talk about uh, some work combining uh, principles that we've learned in um, studies being run in Latin America. In particular, this is uh, uh, some work in Costa Rica. Um, here's a, a sample image from a project that I'm doing in Tanzania um, with tablet-based learning. Um, this one happens to be sponsored by the XPRIZE Foundation. We're one of five finalists, the only academic team still in this competition. We're competing for a $10 million prize uh, if, for the team that in, uh, increases learning the most. And we'll find out on May 15th. So everybody keep your fingers crossed for me. <laughs> And then thirdly, um, uh, work we're doing in the Cote d'Ivoire, the Ivory Coast, uh, with learners learning literacy uh, over the cell phone. And the general approach that we take on all of this work is one called design-based research. This comes out of um, at the learning sciences literature, uh, but it highly applies to HCI in general. So uh, in this approach, we um, focus our problem set. We work on understanding the context and the domain. We define the, the types of things we're doing based in, on that understanding. We're designing and developing new solutions and building them. And then we go out and test them. And that all looks on the surface like a linear process, but actually involves a whole lot of looping back and forth uh, and multiple iterations of uh, defining, conceiving, building, and testing things, and maybe even going back to re-understand the situation um, in the field. So that's the, the general process we've taken for all of this. And here is what we've learned from doing that. Principle number one is the importance of context-sensitive design. So the first thing you might think about when you think about putting a technology in a new place is the need for translation. So obviously, if your learners speak Spanish, you can't present them with an interface in English. It's like basic 101. We need to get it in the right language. One of the interesting things that happens, though, is it turns out it's not just language. We worked with folks who thought that um, Mathematics, for instance, is a universal language. Everybody understands math. Math works the same in every place. And actually, it turns out that it 
It almost does, but not quite. So for instance, um, here's an example of how long division is often done in America. This was described by an, a Norwegian student living in America as something strange to her. Um, it says, uh, no one is using this algorithm in Norway anymore. <laughs> uh, so you can see the eights on the left, and then you have this little house sort of thing. Uh, in Spain, you actually, the same mathematics problem is done in reverse, right? The eight is now on the right-hand side, and you have the little division symbol in between them. So a very different approach to this. And then even within a country, so we looked at uh, Spain, and then in Catalonia, right? Completely <laughs> uh, different from everything else. Now we turn our house upside down and, and put the eight inside of it. Um, I've seen examples of four different, different than this ways of doing long division in Latin America, in countries that border one another, and none of those countries knew that the other country did it differently. <laughs> Um, this causes enormous confusion, as you might imagine, for students when they're asked to do it in a different format than their teacher knows um, or that anybody else knows around them. Okay, so that's just the uh, um, so basics of, of making sure that your interface like, presents the right stuff. Going beyond that, thinking about learner autonomy and motivation, some of the key principles for making sure that our learning technologies work. Here's an example of a study that looked at um, the impact of choice on students' performance and engagement. And the vast majority of the learning sciences literature would tell you that students, kids being able to choose what they work on is the best thing for them, right? So you get to pick which of these three problems you work on, uh, whatever one you want, and when you choose your problem, you work harder, you work longer, and you end up solving those problems faster and more accurately. An alternative to that approach is one that asks your family to choose for you. That seems maybe a little strange to me personally. I wouldn't want my parents picking what problems I have to work on, I'd rebel. <laughs> However, it turns out that in Confucian heritage cultures, this can often be a stronger motivator to do work and to do work more persistently and to do work more accurately than allowing students to have their own personal choice. So something we might have assumed was true for everybody does not necessarily hold for all. And this is something that's really important to understand as we're figuring out how to get kids to actually work on hard math problems. right? And then, to go even one level beyond that, I'll show you uh, some software that we were using uh, in our studies in Latin America, in Costa Rica specifically, um, uh, where now a lot of the behaviors are being driven by underlying algorithms and models. Things like when and where and how to give feedback, up there on the top, when and where and how to give help from the system. So there's a lot of technology going on behind the scenes here. Uh, we were working in, uh, here in Costa Rica uh, on uh, systems that had been donated by a, a corporation. And so the, the schools all have computer labs. Um, uh, plenty of technology in this context, as you can see, had trouble getting the kids to give up their cell phones. <laughs> Um, and so we do a lot of work to prepare for these studies, right? We have teacher meetings, we do pilot testing, we work on transitioning American versions to local versions, doing all of that hard work. Um, and then when we're actually there, we do our evaluation by giving children a pretest and a set of surveys. Um, we have them work on the algebra concepts for a while in the software, and then we post-test them to understand what they've learned from it. And along the way, we collect all sorts of different kinds of data as well. So if we just look at the pretest and the post-test here, what we find is really good gains. So the US, the students in the US looked like this in a very similar study we ran there. Um, so they went from, what, 65-ish to almost 80% accurate on the post-test, and our Costa Rican students almost caught up. So they started out much lower, 32% on the pre-test, and ended up not quite as high as the American students, but at, uh, where are we at? 
72 or so on the post-test. So that's great. We showed that, that students learned from using this system. But now we actually dive into the system logs to see if there's any way that we can actually make this better. They, they're still at a C level. Can we improve the way they do this? And one of the things that we looked at was some of those underlying models of the system. So what's actually going on <coughs> under the hood? And one of those that I mentioned a minute ago was looking at help seeking, right? How are people actually using the system for help? When is it providing the help? Um, are they choosing the right times and the right things to give for help? So this is just an example of what one of those models might look like and visualized, right? It's just sort of a flow chart. Think about the step. If it's familiar, then you ask for a hint. Otherwise, if you have a sense of what to do, you go this way or that way. So that's just a visualization of what it looks like. Under the hood, um, what we do is a, a whole bunch of um, computer science processes of working with models where we do feature engineering, selecting the right features, optimizing to make sure that we understand which features of help seeking are actually working. And you come out with a list something like this. Uh, whew, it's kind of a... Uh, uh, indecipherable, but things like um, whether students are avoiding help, whether they're selecting help when it's unneeded, et cetera, et cetera. We have a bunch of definitions for all of these features of the learning. So not important to actually understand the details of this right now, but <clears throat> what we do is evaluate whether these models are actually working for these learners. <clears throat> so what we did was to look at the data from the Costa Rican students and run it on the model which had been built in the United States. Right? So can we actually predict Costa Rican students learning from this model that we built in the US? Turns out that you cannot. In fact, as you can see, there's even an almost a slight negative correlation between what Costa Rican students are doing and what the model predicts that they should be doing. So that's not good. <laughs> um, what happens if instead we rerun the model and we combine all of this data, we put the Costa Rican students' data in the model too, so now we have a much bigger model, should be more accurate, and we look at whether now this can actually predict whether Costa Rican students learn or not. We cannot. <laughs> we got it slightly better, but we're still negative. So what? is happening here? What could be going on in the classroom that explains these differences? In fact, what we see is that help-seeking behaviors differ in their log data so far that no help-seeking features from the Costa Rican students actually even appeared in the US model. So the models look completely different from one another uh, from the AI point of view. And in fact, many of the features in the Costa Rican model went in the opposite direction of what we would have predicted they should be from theory. Why is that? And what can we do to design appropriate solutions are our next questions. So in order to understand this, fortunately, we still had a ton more data that we could look at, right? So we, we did a lot of investigation in the mathematics classroom before we even went into the lab. We also did lots of field observations while students were actually using the system. And so we could use that data maybe to explain this. So here what you see is an image of our American students using this system. They're all very diligent, sitting at their computer, working hard. Here are our Costa Rican students. They're all still working hard. They're all still diligent but they're working in a group of six, <laughs> right? So we actually took a look and quantified what's happening in this uh, classroom. And what we see, we looked at um, where the learning environment was taking place. Was it, was it the classroom, the math classroom, or was it the lab where the computers were? We looked across different schools, rural and urban schools. And what we find is that the most uh, significant difference here is in the classroom, the kids were engaging in lots of collaborative behavior. So almost 47% of everything they did in the classroom was collaborative. Uh, this was the biggest difference. 
We then looked, you know, collaborative behavior is, is one thing, but is it actually <laughs> engaged in the task is another. So we reduced this down to just how much of their behavior is on task collaborative behavior. And even that, 30% of what the students were doing in the classroom was on task collaborative behavior. Now you can contrast that in the lab, 14% of what they were doing was on task collaborative behavior. So just the fact of going into the lab and working on the computers almost dropped this by half. So that's one interesting observation already. But then we asked, what can we compare this to? And we have only a few other studies out there that look at students working with these intelligent tutoring systems that have actually measured their collaborative behavior there. And what we find is that in America, the average uh, amount of on-task collaborative behavior is 4%. We have, a <laughs> we have another sample from the Philippines that happens to be 9%. But critically here, we've got three times more collaboration happening compared to US classrooms. Could this explain why help-seeking models look different in our Costa Rican data, right? Where is their help-seeking happening? from their friends, <laughs> exactly. They're not asking the system for help. They're asking their neighbor. They're asking uh, their best friend across the room. They're asking the teacher. This is why it's not showing up in the data and why what they are doing in, on the computer is happening in ways that, that wouldn't be predicted by theory. Now, this is great. We've got you know, uh, students who learned almost as much, uh, but not quite, while engaging in these behaviors they, that weren't modeled by our system. But what does that actually look like in practice? Here is an example exchange. You can read that. The first girl says, it's 3-6. Uh, that's wrong. Girl two says, 3 fourths. Girl three says, no, 3 fifths. Girl two says, no, it's 3 fourths. I don't think so, says girl one. She types in three fourths. That's right. And the third girl says, ha! <laughs> and that's the end of it. And they move on. <laughs> all right. So it is collaborative. They're all adding uh, ideas into this conversation. They're not doing this alone. The, the girl who's typing is taking suggestions from everybody else. But what we see is that it's not transactive. So this is a, a key term from the collaboration literature that says people are actually building on each other's ideas. Um, they're taking what was said and they're working on it and, and they're coming up with a better solution together or even explaining what they're doing and why so that the other participants understand. So, so again, it's great that students are able to um, achieve such gains with software that, that doesn't work for them. However, could you imagine if we build something that actually uh, has system-supported help to work on getting kids to explain their answers to one another, to push each other harder? Are they just going to maybe uh, try random answers until they get one that's right? Or can we actually get them to work together and solve these problems in a transactive way? So that's what we're working on. Uh, in building new models, uh, along with a better system design that actually supports these learners where they're at and takes advantage of that collaborative power in order to support them better. So generally, what's the, the um, outcome here for our systems as a whole? What's the principle? This is to do context-sensitive design, where you actually deeply know your context, your there, you observe it, uh, you understand what's happening. Using learning sciences principles that are actually built on students in your context and uh, going so far as to build our AI models actually with learners in the context that you need. So we're going to add in language and context into each of these parts of our system diagram. So my suggestion is that we actually Consider this from the very beginning as we're planning out our system architectures. OK, point number two, physical infrastructure. So this is something that um, uh, I think is, can be a little rarer to think about as we're building computer-based systems, especially if you're thinking about building it for a screen. But I'm going to tell you about some work uh, happening in the east coast of Africa, in Tanzania. 
uh, where the major occupations for students in the region were uh, goat and cattle farming, and where they had limited water and electricity. So you can see, here's a picture. They, there is electricity, but it's often concentrated in one place or happens irregularly. So for instance, people bring their phones to uh, the town center and plug them in for a couple of hours before they head back home because this particular place has more consistent access to electricity. Um, so here we've conducted three studies. Uh, in which, again, we do observations, we um, conduct interviews and test prototypes, uh, we work out our design guidelines, we build a system, we've had a year-long deployment there, um, we do observations over certain weeks of it, um, and then we do redesigns and, and uh, observe again what's happening. Uh, sorry, this is work done my, by my student Judith, which do you know? Uh, and then secondly, another study, set of studies in the Ivory Coast, Cote d'Ivoire. This is on the west coast of Africa now, uh, where um, what they do uh, for a living tends to be cocoa farming. So these are rural cocoa communities that we're working in. Um, and there are some major issues with literacy here. So we're working on literacy applications. Um, Many students in both of our regions where we were working were not able to read a single age-appropriate word. Uh, so some, some real severe impacts of issues like child labor and lack of um, teacher professional development on what's happening in these classrooms. And again, we, here we have three studies uh, with a similar approach here. Our system's called Allo Alphabet. And we've got six week deployments and we're actually right in the middle of study three right now where we've redesigned our system. We've got a four month randomized controlled trial going on uh, and um, we'll hopefully see some good results from that. This is from my students, Michael Medeo and Vikram Kamath. So physical infrastructure is what we're talking about here. One of the first things that people do often think about when they think about uh, physical infrastructure particularly in Southeast Asia or in, or in Africa, is um, electricity. And this is a critical thing, something that should be absolutely considered. So um, even in our villages where they had electricity, we, as you can see, brought along our own solar panels uh, because uh, you may have times where the electricity goes out for three or four days in a row, and you need to make sure that you're prepared. Um, uh, whether to support um, uh, learners with the device that you're giving them or just to help the families out, like here's, here's uh, access to electricity that gives you something that you might need. So, so that's number one. We bring our, our power options with us. Um, and then the second thing that we think about quite a lot is our choice of platform or device. So in the Ivory Coast, mobile adoption is at 130%. <laughs> what does that mean? There's more than one phone per person in the country. So there are lots of people who own multiple phones. However, it turns out the, that the majority of these are low cost feature phones, not smartphones or tablets. And so there's a lot of design and deployment going on right now with smartphones. Uh, because they offer so many more features, obviously, than our basic phones. They have a big screen. Um, they have uh, the ability to show pictures and images and, and movies, which is great, except for uh, despite widespread reports that smartphones are, are sweeping uh, the continent, most, the vast majority of people still only own feature phones, unless you only want to reach folks in the urban city centers. So in this case, in Ivory Coast, we chose to deploy on the phones that the uh, parents already owned. So feature phones where they've got a small screen and physical uh, number keypad. So immediately that meant that we are constrained in, types, in terms of the interactions that people could use on this phone. And we also recognize the severe lack of literacy in these environments. So the approach we chose to take was to use almost exclusively a voice interface. So students are calling in 
on what's called an interactive voice response system where they can talk into the phone, they can get responses back, and the phone uh, can recognize and adapt to their answers. We combine that with an SMS uh, approach so that as they progress through the literacy curriculum, they could start looking at uh, the orthography or the spelling and, and way that letters look on the screen. So this is a, a choice we made that limited the types of things we were able to do. But it was a choice that we made in order to make sure that the families could actually work with this uh, software. On the other hand, in Tanzania, we were constrained by the funders and the other constituents and stakeholders in this environment. And so we had a requirement that we had to use tablets. Um, what we found in our deployments, despite the fact that there's Again, widespread reports that all you have to do is introduce a tablet to a kid and they are immediately able to start using it. Um, maybe you've seen this if, uh, uh, with two-year-olds on the internet where they just start swiping and you know, everything's no problem. One of the reasons for this in, in an environment like uh, Stanford is because they've been watching their parents do it for two years. <laughs> What we found in our case was that only two children out of 198 that we observed were able to tap correctly without help, often even after we left them alone for an hour or two hours with the device. So uh, we have to keep in mind that training is needed if we're going to actually conceive of this as an appropriate support tool. Uh, some other interesting things that we found in physical infrastructure needs were uh, data transport. <laughs> so we expect to just be able to, to deliver uh, our uh, data to connect to the network to, um, to provide uh, updates, to write um, solutions, to collect students' data. And in many cases, we actually turned out having to employ motorcycle drivers, <laughs> boat a boat as they're called, to deliver USB keys uh, with updates to our software in order for them to get to the learners in a timely fashion. Beyond that, we actually uh, worked with a type of job that's not seen too frequently in, in the US anymore called a griot. This is somebody who, uh, the closest English word is, is like a town crier, right? They actually go out and they tell the news, maybe they uh, um, tell stories or they keep the oral history, but this is a way to get updates out into the community when you don't have a technological solution, right? So we paid somebody to provide updates on, for instance, when the study was starting or uh, we found a bug with the system uh, that people were not able to continue using it and that we had to pay somebody to go out and spread the word physically uh, that this was the way the system was going to be working now. So um, for physical infrastructure, we found that you really need to pay attention to three things, the devices, the interface and the modality, and all of the communication that happens around such systems. And once again, we think um, actually adding uh, the physical infrastructure into your system architecture is the only way to make sure that these features are actually considered, whether it's a motorcycle or some other way of actually delivering the approach that you need uh, to get updates or um, data in and out of your system. The really critical piece of this is that last mile, right? So um, if you've heard of this, this is a problem in transportation in general. Uh, you have bus systems or train systems that get, get people everywhere, but then what happens when they get off of that train? They need transportation to get to that that last little bit of the endpoint. So all of our systems worked very well. Um, we could test them in-house. People could use them in the context, but it's getting that last step of getting them to actually be able to use it in the field that requires that extra physical infrastructure that we hadn't put in place in the first part. 
And then finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about human infrastructure. So physical infrastructure sort of started to bleed into this, right? We needed a motorcycle driver. We needed a town crier to actually go out and tell people about uh, our studies and, and what was happening. But there's a lot of other phys uh, human infrastructure that needs to be involved in the deployment of these software uh, um, systems as well. The first one I'll mention is peers. Of course, I talked about that in our Costa Rican data, right? There were um, children helping one another. There was a lot of collaboration going on. Thinking about peers uh, is a really important part of building any educational system. Um, and in particular, in the Ivory Coast, we had parents who said this was really important to them. All my children must be at the same level. There's none who can be above the others. If I have five children and I show something to one, the others must also understand that thing. Right? So really critical that kids are all working together. However, um, in our work in Tanzania, we actually experimentally deployed uh, an approach in which um, uh, sorry, and, uh, the title of this slide is wrong. The, the three points here were our three conditions. We had no leader assigned, so the kids were just able to work as they desired. We had a privately assigned and trained leader, so we took one kid aside and said, hey, you're going to be the helper for this group. Here's how you do it, and let them go. And then in the third case, we told everybody in the group, hey, this child is the leader. They're going to help you when you need help. Make sure to ask if you need help. And uh, that child was trained in how to support them. So what did we find? We found that in this context, peers only provided help to one another when all of the following conditions were true. They had to notice a peer struggling, or the peer had to directly ask for help. And then the peer had to only be one of those that was adjacent to them. <laughs> they were also uh, required to not be so in-depth in their own enjoyment of the, the game that they were playing that they wanted to, to take a step back and help their other peer. And then it only happened in cases where they already knew what the answer was. So I've seen that problem before. I'll help you click here. Um, if they had to stop and consider how to support them with a new solution, that help didn't happen. A lot of the work that happens in these contexts assumes that peer leaders will naturally emerge. So, you know, we'd give a bunch of tablets to a bunch of students, one of them's going to figure it out, and they're going to tell all of the others. So we don't have to worry about actually building this support into the system. Well, in our observations, we found that children, even when they were naturally sort of helpers in the classroom, they did not do this sort of help when they got out into the field with the system. Um, in fact, they ignored an average of 79% of all help requests. <laughs> this doesn't mean, however, that they never helped each other. They provided the best help when two things were true. They were trained, so not the one where we, not in the condition where we didn't train anyone and we just assumed that leaders might emerge, so they had to be trained. And there was a social expectation of them providing support, so the publicly assigned leader condition. So everyone else was told, this is the person you go to for help. So this gives us some indications of how we might actually build support into the system for these things to happen, right? You can publicly designate a leader in a system. You can tell people to go ask. You can support these leaders uh, with training when needed. All right, we're, uh, we're coming towards the end of class, so I want to make sure to give a, a chance for questions. So I'm going to go through this a little bit more quickly. Uh, teachers are some a group of people that are also often neglected in this space um, with the idea that maybe teachers actually get in the way. So what did we find when we looked at how teachers actually supported these uh, students? We found that teachers provided three things, three types of support. One was application support, so here's how you get into this game, here's how you go to this other game. The second was knowledge support, so here's actually how this math concept works, or here's how you read this word. And then the third was digital literacy support. So again, kids had a lot of trouble working on tablets by themselves. Teachers were there to help them. 
Another thing that they provided outside of these direct forms of support were a motivation to persist. So in the school environment, students were diligently working. We went to home environments and watched children use these here as well. It's a little blurry, but you can see this kid has just gotten totally exhausted, throws himself down on the couch, and has completely given up for the day. He can't figure out how to do this next thing, so he's done with it. Teachers really provided that uh, support for persistence, that, that motivation to continue. What they did not provide, on the other hand, was uh, support for exploration. So in our school environment, the uh, students were very directed. The teachers, even when unprompted, would come tell them what to do. Uh, this is where you should go next. Here's how to, to proceed. Whereas in the home environment, this is where we saw others who were not involved in the study come over, ask what this thing was about, how, what happens if you click over here. And so they ended up seeing a much wider set of content and trying a much wider set of things that were available in the software than they ever did in the schools. Um, yeah. All right, I'm going to skip through this bit a little bit, but um, one of the interesting things that we saw was that uh, sometimes um, parents didn't necessarily have much trust in the system. Uh, the education system in Cote d'Ivoire has changed so much that the children must have tutors, because without the tutors, I am sure that the child cannot make it out of the system. So they paid the what very tiny, tiny amounts of money they had left over at the end of the month to actually have somebody come into their home or uh, get a group of students and basically have like a second school day after the end of school. Um, and so this is sort of what that looked like. You know, they might have a a um, blackboard at home to support this, and we have a tutor who would help them provide the support at home. And sometimes this was because the teachers themselves did not have the domain knowledge, and so they were not able to support the, the children on that. Um, so, you know, many of our parents, uh, despite being extremely low income, valued education to the extent that they paid for materials at home and for home tutors as well. Now, moving into the idea of parents and adult supporters, well, it turns out that they're pretty foundational. We know this from a lot of studies around the world in terms of providing um, uh, an environment in which literacy can thrive. Um, you may have seen some of the studies that show that uh, high-income children in the United States are exposed to about a million more words than low-income children in the United States. And so a lot of this literacy, early work in literacy, even before you get to writing, is happening at home. So we wanted to understand uh, how parents and other adult supporters might actually provide an environment for these sorts of uh, software systems to thrive. Um, so some of the things that we found were that um, only 12 out of 38 of our participants in study two reported having a parent who was literate. So the parents themselves may not know how to read or write, and uh, we believe this was an over-reporting. So they're reporting a parent who can read or write, again, at maybe a second grade level. So there's very little actual uh, school-based literacy support that they can get from their parents. However, the things that parents were able to provide were, again, digital literacy. So they are actually able to make the phone call for the kids and get them onto it. They're able to find uh, um, the right number in the contact list. They're able to interpret between what's happening on the phone and, and what the kids actually need to do. So this is important because in some other environments, around the world, what we find is that children are actually the ones that help the adults with digital literacy. So they pick something up and then, you know, they show that new thing to their parents. In these sorts of environments, for the vast majority of cases, it's the other way around. One of the reasons for that is because adults and parents are in control of the technology and the children only are allowed to use technology when their parents give them permission. 
Uh, the next thing that they do is communicate the value of literacy to their children. So um, they can say, I can send my child out into the world without worrying, knowing that my child knows how to write. If I see that they're planning to go out alone to the child nearby, I can write a little something. So they get, give their child tasks. Or they uh, tell the child, pay attention to everything you learn at school, because that is what will allow you to move ahead. Or if you do not study, and if, for example, I die and leave you all alone, what are you going to eat? Really strong motivation for their children to pay attention in, to, in school and to learn how to read. So we actually, uh, in the end, after study two, developed an adult literacy support tool that helps them do a number of things, including learn why this work is important, uh, support them in helping and motivating their children, so encouraging them to give this advice that they're giving to the children to help motivate them to continue. And finally, to actually maybe learn some of the content themselves. So under the guise of, here's how you could help your child, we gave them similar exercises as their children, and then if they so desired, they could also pick up some of these uh, literacy concepts. So I'm going to... Uh, go give you just a preliminary look at this. We're still, as I said, just in the middle of this larger scale study. But what we find is that students with parental support answer 10% more questions correctly in the system, even when the parents themselves are not literate. So the parents aren't giving them the answers. Um, and in fact, one of our participants said, it's not like I know anything about it, but since the tutor's not there, uh, what you know at school, what you've been shown there, you have to do in front of me, right? So they're motivating them to do this even when they don't know what the answers are. Um, interestingly, to explain this, we saw no effect of children's pretest performance on their correctness. So, I mean, everybody was pretty low to begin with, but it didn't quite matter what you knew before. What did matter was the number of calls the user made to the system, and that impacted correctness uh, the, of children's ability to answer. So we think what's happening is the children with parental support are getting encouraged to call more often, and they're working harder on these questions, and they're getting more of those questions correct. All right, so uh, the sum here is to say one way or another, everyone in the house brings their grain of salt in reinforcing the education of the child, which brings us to the conclusion of our human infrastructure, where we actually want you to build these supports into the system, into the architecture diagram from the beginning, and not just sort of rely on that they might happen when they get out there in the real world. OK, so in sum, I've talked about three main principles, context-sensitive design, physical infrastructure, and human infrastructure. These are the three things that we believe need to be physically added in to your system and thought about from the very beginning. Uh, and uh, there are lots and lots of people who have contributed to this work, so I'd like to give a big thank you to everybody, and thank you to everybody here for being so patient and, and uh, attentive with me. I hope uh, you've uh, learned something interesting today. <laughs>